So moving on, I would like to introduce Emily Winkenwerder. So Emily is one of the pathologists at um, EMAI in Sydney. So we use EMAI for the bulk of our lab testing. And I must say the pathologists there are fantastic um, for any kind of advice. Um, they're fantastic for us and I'm sure they're fantastic for private vets too. Um, so I'd like to introduce Emily to come up and talk about um, pathology and sampling and um, sampling of um, animals and the submission process. I'm one of the new veterinary pathologists at the EMAI and I'll just be going through some kind of basics, sample collection and submission and then some EAD samples. Um, so as you guys probably know, there's a lot of different kind of samples that you can take for various tests. Um, so bloods are really good for antemortem testing. Um, it's a good idea to get bloods from affected and unaffected animals, um, so we can use that as um, a comparison. Um, um, getting a range of samples, including EDTA, lithep and serum. Um, minimum as a clotted and unclotted blood is good uh, for various tests. Um, for postmortem, um, heart blood, uh, it's a maybe from us. So it can, it, like, as soon as the animal dies, um, a lot of the biochemistry and haematology um, analytes change. Um, so it's pretty much useless for haematology and biochemistry. Um, but we can use it for some PCRs or potentially um, some sep doing cultures um, for septicemias. Um, Clot activated tubes, so those are the ones that you spin down and the gel will separate the serum um, from the um, clot. Uh, we prefer not to have that just because if, um, uh, if we need to get to the clot, uh, we can't. And also uh, there's a potential um, for um, some uh, zinc and copper um, um, contamination in there. Um, so we prefer not to have those. Um, fresh tissues, please uh, put your tissues in individual labelled pots um, and take a representative area. Um, less isn't more, um, so do give us quite decent sized chunks for us. Um, a tip for us is pre-labelled pots. Um, so when we go out for a postmortem, we'll write all the samples that we want um, and then there's less chance of us forgetting the sample that we need um, and it also saves you guys if you're in the middle of the night, you've done a PM, like trying to determine what thing is what. Um, swabs, there's a few types of swabs. Uh, dry is good for bacterial and fungal culture as well as PCR. Um, we've got the Amy swabs, which are good for um, specifically bacterial culture, um, and uh, our PBGS swabs, which are, only, are good for only PCR. Um, so it's important to get those correct. Um, a tip from us is don't swab draining um, lesions and pus because we do get a lot of secondary growth, um, if you do want to kind of see what it is, maybe like do a, a, around the lesion um, and you're more likely to get a better answer that way. Um, so there's a couple of fluids. Um, it, a pericardial fluid is really useful in abortion investigations. Um, we do a lot of tests from pericardial fluid. If you can't get that, thoracic is good. Um, CSF is good for neurological um, diseases. And then there's joint fluid, gastrointestinal contents are good for toxin screenings. Um, and um, it can be used in abortion uh, investigations as well. We can do a culture on the stomach contents of fetuses um, and urine. Um, please label uh, um, your tubes. <laughs> Um, you'll see a theme there. Um, so aqueous humour is um, good for postmortem um, samples um, and you're really aiming for that anterior chamber where it's more fluid-like rather than the vitreous chamber which is more jelly-like. 
um, and it's really good for sudden death cases. Um, so you can test for a urea toxicity, say, um, or nitrate nitrite. Um, you can look for ketosis. So I just think it's, it's a good thing um, if you are trying to get an answer in these sudden death cases. Um, what tube do you want that? Uh, it can just be in like a little, a plain tube, yeah. Um, so fixed tissues, uh, small samples, uh, one to two centimetres thick. Um, so formalin penetrates the tissue quite slowly at one mi millimetre an hour. Um, so um, getting those thin sections means that the formalin will penetrate quicker and we'll have better samples, uh, which really helps us with um, histo interpretation. Um, so representative areas, so we've got a bronco pneumonia um, there and then in the red s square you have the kind of the margin between the affected and unaffected area um, and that's good for histo for us um, so we can get a bit of a comparison. Um, and formalin to tissue ratio of 10 to 1, so little bits of tissue and lots and lots of formalin so it can fix properly. Um, general uh, submission information, so keep your paperwork uh, clearly visible, protect your paperwork and separate your paperwork from the samples. The best way I, um, that I can think of is put it in a Ziploc bag and then you can put it on top of your samples in the ESCII. Um, so then we, when we open the ESCII, that's the first thing that we'll see. Um, and consider when you're submitting, because couriers do different things. Um, so if you are you have samples um, on the Friday especially, uh, you need to consider that potentially the courier won't deliver the samples until the Monday. Um, so potentially keeping those samples in clinic um, over the weekend um, and then submitting later. However, if you do think that it is an EAD um, and you've like called the hotline and they do think it is a higher risk, um, then we will endeavour to get those samples to us sooner um, by different methods. Um, so just a quick to do and not to do. Um, on the left, we've got um, nicely labelled um, pots. And then on the right, I don't know what's where that swab has been taken from. I don't know the organ. Um, I would probably very likely be calling you to see what that um, swab is. Um, so please don't do that. Please label your samples. Um, again, on the left, uh, we have nicely filled out paperwork. I know who it's from. Um, the spec advice is at the top and separated. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then um, the uh, blood tubes are nicely packaged. Um, if you don't package them, you'll probably get what's on the right. They'll jumble up um, during the courier thing and our staff have to go through and organise everything again. Um, so please don't do that. Um, this one, don't do either of them. Um, <laughs> please don't give us uh, sharps. It's a big no-no from us um, and I don't want your dirty gloves. So <laughs> um, and on the right is a big... Um, biohazard risk for us because we have no idea what's going to uh, e be in the ESCII when we open it up. Um, so if there's a potential for like zoonoses. Um, so if you do have a messy box, maybe just transfer your samples to a clean one. Um, for notifiable slash zoonotic submissions, um, it's a good idea to double bag your samples at a minimum. So if something does happen, it hopefully will be contained keep your paperwork separate and label the samples. Um, another thing uh, to consider is to submit your EAD samples separately to your non-zoonotic other cases um, because we do um, treat EAD samples differently in the lab. Um, so everything that is in that um, box um, will have to wait until the EAD has been excluded before other testing can happen. Um, so if you've got like faeces for a faecal egg count, put that in a different box and send it separately so then we can get that, those results out to you quicker. Um, quickly, our submission form. Um, you can find this online. Um, 
put your um, submitted de details. Um, we sometimes we have to call you, um, so it's a good idea to put your phone number. Um, and then next is the disease um, suspected, so that just gives us a overview of what you guys are th thinking it is, any EADs that you're concerned about. Uh, case history, please, um, please, please put your uh, species that you're dealing with. Uh, we do have a few species-specific tests, and I have had to ring a couple of people to ask whether it is a sheep or a cow. Um, and then it's also good to put in the age and the number of affected. Um, that helps us. Um, and then next is the history. Um, summarise the relevant information. Um, and then on the back, we have a list of our most common tests that we perform. This um, list is not all of the tests that we have at the EMAI. Um, so if you don't see it there, um, down the bottom, there's that blue other section and you can write what tests you want down there and we'll see what we can do. Um, also, we have a little tick box at the top of this side. Um, and if you tick that, um, we will, the, a veterinary pathologist will ring you to discuss the case. Um, so I'll just go through the samples needed for the emergency diseases, plus a bonus one, Japanese encephalitis. Um, so as Liz mentioned, there's low and high pathogen AI. Um, and just a reminder that there are um, um, asymptomatic um, reservoir hosts um, just recently, we've had a few uh, wild ducks that have tested positive for um, low pathogen AI, so it is out there. Um, so for um, samples, a tracheal and cloacal swabs, uh, PB, it's preferred PBGS or dry. Um, and please wear your PPE, especially you know, including masks. Um, because the virus can be aerosolized and it is um, a zoonotic risk. If you don't happen to have your PPE, um, as Liz said, we are happy to um, get the um, whole chicken in at the EMAI and we can do the swabs for you. Um, Af African horse sickness is exotic and notifiable. I just like pictures, more pictures the better, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> Um, of potential facial swellings and um, conjunctival lesions. Um, for that, we like clotted and unclotted blood, um, so we can do serology and PCR. Um, African swine fever, this is just a few um, cutaneous lesions that you may see. Um, for live pigs, uh, clotted and unclotted blood again. Um, plus PBGS swabs of the oral cavity, tonsils and nasal cavity. Um, in dead pigs, um, those same PBGS swabs. Um, and then uh, fresh tissues, um, especially those lymphoid tissues like the tonsils, spleen and lymph nodes, as well as uh, lung, kidney and ileum. And then um, a range of fixed tissues. Um, so lumpy skin disease, as you guys know, causes um, skin lumps, but it can also um, cause similar um, nodules in the gastrointestinal um, and respiratory um, organs. So that's just something to remember when you are sampling. Um, again, um, the clotted and unclotted blood plus fresh and fixed tissues of those skin lesions, scabs, if there's any vesicular fluid, um, and any other lesions that you see in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract, as well as skin scrapings. Um, so we can do PCRs and viral isolation. Um, and histology is really good because not only it can rule out lumpy skin, but it can also give you often um, an alternate diagnosis in these cases. Um, foot and mouth disease, um, it, um, these are just a few pictures, so like you can have unruptured vesicles on the day one, but then by day two they can rupture, so you can see how it um, transmits quite quickly. Um, and then following on from that, 
Uh, you get, start to get fibrin deposition and then from day seven you start to get fibrosis. Um, and um, the, there's some feet lesions. Um, for sampling, um, swabs of the ulcers in PBGS or dry. Um, if you can get any epithelium of the vesicle um, and any vesicular fluid. And then um, oral, nasal and tonsillar swabs are really good, especially if there's no lesions present. So if you were trying to screen for FMD in a herd, um, those are good samples, plus EDTA and serum. Um, I just thought I would include Japanese encephalitis because it did have such a major impact on, on the pig industry um, last year when it came down south. Um, so it's a flavivirus that is transmitted um, by mosquitoes um, and its natural host is the waterfowl. However, pigs amplified the disease um, and both horses and humans um, can get JE, um, however they are considered dead end hosts. So it's a notifiable disease with a potential zoonotic um, potential. Um, so um, although there has been no cases of pigs directly transmitting JE to humans, they do have a high viral load, so it is a concern. Um, so as you guys probably know, it was in Asia and just last year it has come down south. Um, clinical signs, so in non-pregnant sows there's not really many signs and then in pregnant sows they can have abortions um, or pig, piglets can be mummified or have malformations. Um, boars can have swollen testicles uh, and then Pigs, piglets can either be born weak or if they're infected after birth, they can have neurological signs up to six weeks old, oh, six months old, um, plus wasting and depression in those older ones. Um, and then these are a few pictures that we have taken from the outbreak last year in our lab. So we saw a lot of mummified fetuses and a lot of fetuses with um, lots of uh, fluid in their body cavities and the main changes were these brain lesions, so cortical discoloration um, in Malaysia um, and then we did get a lot of um, hydrocephalus and hydroencephaly. Um, there were some that like the brain cavity was just like filled with fluid and there wasn't really much brain left. Um, so for post-mortem um, we prefer fresh brain, spleen, pericardial or thoracic fluid. Um, also tonsils is good, oh, and liver, and um, CSF. Um, if you aren't happy to do a post-mortem, um, we, we at the EMAI are happy to get those um, aborted or mummified fetuses and we can do a post-mortem there. Um, and in breeder pigs, um, serum and semen can be used um, to rule it out. Um, just a note, JE in horses, most clinical disease is mild, um, however some horses do have neurological signs. Um, and for testing for that, we do paired serum samples two to four weeks apart, um, and we're looking for a rising teeter in those cases. Um, and then finally, I guess before a risk assessment, so before any PM that we do, we do a risk assessment. Um, and this one's kind of modified from the one that we use, but it's really just thinking about the risks that um, could potentially happen in a zoonosis. Um, and then we're looking at the consequences. So from, will it just require first aid to uh, will it kill me um, and the probability from very unlikely uh, to very likely it probably will happen and then from there you can um, get your square and you can see whether it's a high, medium or low risk and then down the bottom um, it can give you an idea of what PPE you may need and um, what samples um, are appropriate. Um, and yeah, that's all. <laughs> Stay up here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, I often think that pathologists have a 
hard enough job and I think if we send them in samples that aren't up to speed it just makes that job so much harder so one of the lessons I've learned since working here and having to take samples is a diagnosis by a pathologist is only as good as the sample that's submitted so and there will be time obviously in the prax to um, to learn more about um, sample collection and submission so thank you Emily that was excellent